We're back together again. Carefree cooks everywhere. Welcome. It's Tuesday Talk Live. It's noon here in beautiful downtown Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, that means we're together again because we don't want to hear what some cookbook author has to say about what we should cook and how we should cook it. We can make up our own stuff, right? That's what our community is about. It's good to be together again on Tuesday Talk Live. Welcome, everyone. Let me uh, see if I refresh my page here. If I can see who's talking to me. Hey, LaDorna, welcome. Uh, Wilma is here. Good morning to Wilma. Hi, Carla and Marla and Andrew and Linda. I have to figure out a way to get my chat box to be bigger. I have this little tiny box that I can't see the chats very well. Thank you for the thumbs up, uh, everyone. Uh, Kamal is here. Welcome, Kamal. Um, yeah, thanks for your knowledge. That's kind of you. I appreciate that, Kamal. Thank you. Uh, that's a new name for me. Welcome to our community. Terry Burns is here from Miami, Florida. Um, Darlene is here as well. Hey, Darlene. Lucy, that's good. All right, I can't just read off <laughs> names today. Thank you for the thumbs up uh, because we got a lot of stuff to talk about uh, and, and to try and make your cooking at home easier. And that's really what my mission is all about is having spent so many years owning cooking schools, teaching cooking, uh, having been a certified culinary educator, having been a culinary college professor, I don't understand why they want to keep these secrets from you, you know? And that's, in all my time doing these things, it was always like, oh, don't share, you know, your recipe. Don't share how you did that because that elevates you as a chef somehow. Oh my goodness, that is entirely backward in my idea. The more I share, the more I'm elevated as a chef. You know, you want all my recipes? I'll give you my recipes because it has nothing to do with the recipe. How you cook is more important than what you cook. But look, we all know that. And if you're listening to me go on this rant at the very beginning of our Tuesday Talk Live, and it's not Tuesday, and I'm not live, well, that's because uh, you have not subscribed uh, to our messenger alert system at webcookingclasses.com slash live so that you get an alert five minutes before I go live. And we've been doing some cool stuff that we're going to talk about in a minute. And you're definitely going to want those alerts because I've been popping up in different places at different different times as the technology gets better and easier for me to use, we can all get together and be carefree cooks together. A carefree cook, you ask? Well, a carefree cook creates their own recipes. A carefree cook brings friends and family together with great food and cooking. A carefree cook learns something new every time they cook. A carefree cook has their own individual cooking style, and that's because they practice pro methods and they wind up loving their cooking. And that's what our community is all about. I'm so glad we're together today. I'm branching out in a lot of different ways, and I get more messages about I missed the Tuesday Talk Live, or I missed your cook-along segment. How can I find out more about that? Of course, the messenger system that I just told you about, but also look for me on Pinterest now. I'm starting to categorize or, or, or catalog uh, these live events on Pinterest. There are uh, images there that you can click on and go back and review. And of course, I'm doing this on Instagram as well. So go find Chef Todd Moore on Pinterest and Instagram, and that way you'll have like a little catalog catalog as these live events start to go forward, right? So it's a Tuesday Talk Live. Who else is joining us? Carla has joined us now. That's good. Let me scroll back to uh, Kevin from Mountain City. Good. Welcome, Kevin. Hey, good morning, Lynn. Uh, good morning, Darlene is saying, "Has I have I started yet? And so I guess Darlene needs to refresh her page. Hi, Margaret from PA. That's good. We got all the gang here, Alan and Darlene and Kerry Eagle. Kerry, you and I have been talking a lot lately for some reason. I'm glad to help you through your uh, culinary journey. And Jerry is here. That's good. Eloisa is here. I love seeing similar names that we get together every Tuesday. And what I was referring to just a minute ago was remember the cook along on Wednesday? This is a new feature that I'm going to be doing more and more and I call it a carefree cook along. So last Wednesday, October 3rd, we did this black bean Mexi chicken using the nine steps in the basic saute method. If you haven't seen this and you weren't there live, like I said, go to Pinterest, 
go to Instagram and you'll be able to see those things there as well as somewhere on the Chef Todd Moore page. So I'm going to try and do them as often as I can, but I can't give you a specific schedule for them right now. So you're going to have to register for that alert system or, or keep an eye on all the social media. Uh, and then on Sunday, I just started cooking this just r really cool dish. I was using leftovers. I was using half a can of this and a little bit of coconut milk. It's Sunday, you know? I, I want to start fresh on Monday. I want to use up some of those ingredients. Had a head of broccoli that had been sitting in there a week. Luckily, I know how to store broccoli correctly, so it was still good. But I, I started whipping up this coconut Thai beef dish, and I said to Heather, I got to share this. I got to share this with people. So on Sunday, in a, just a random pop-up, we only had a few people with us that were already on Facebook. But again, if you're missing these things, you should go to webcookingclasses.com slash live and make sure you're on the messenger bot. Thank you for the hearts and everything. So we're going to do more and more uh, of this. Uh, but, you know, one of the questions that I'm getting so much, and it, it I, I've gotten it a lot, but for some reason I'm getting it more and more, and especially this week, and it, it's this whole idea of cooking for one. And, and a lot of people are asking me, and, and this is something regardless of your age, you know, you, you could be young and cook for one, you could be older and cook for one, you can have no diet at all and have to cook for one, you could have a restrictive diet and have to cook for one, and this is a challenge for people, and I know it. I've been hearing it for years and years and I don't think I've ever had a very good answer for you to, to be honest I've always been like well just cook less you know but I really had to start thinking about this because oh getting a lot of hearts for the subject thank you um, it, really starting to think about this because th this is a challenge for home cooks and it's a challenge for carefree cooks so I, I really sat down this weekend and I really tried to think about how can I give you a plan a better plan for cooking for one and when I started uh, and I I haven't cooked for one in a long, long time. I've been cooking for two for a long time, but I don't, since before I went to culinary school, I was cooking for Heather and I. She's the one that sent me to culinary school. I think it might have been selfish on her part. She just wanted better food. Nonetheless, we all benefit at this point, right? Okay, I digress. <laughs> I digress once again. You need a plan for cooking for one. And what I realized is, you know, being from a, a restaurant and large food service background, being an executive chef at a large hospital, uh, having been a chef at the National Security Agency, feeding 15,000 people twice a day, this is my mantra. This is, this is the bring restaurant food production skills, simplify them, make them easier, give them to home cooks everywhere so you can be better for your diet or for your hobby or for your family. So when I start thinking, how would I explain this? It, it, in my world, in my realm, it, I came up with a lot of professional ideas and some basic home ideas as well. So when I go through this list, number four is going to be the professional one, and that's going to be the meat of, of this little class here, and I've got the magic uh, chalkboard out. I like using an actual chalkboard, none of these whiteboards. I'm old school, clapping out the erasers and things like that, <laughs> right? All right, so when we're thinking about cooking for one, there are four elements that we need to think of. First is shopping. Will this change your shopping at all? Now, if you're cooking for one, you can definitely buy the family pack of chicken breasts and break them down and so on, but your shopping should change a little bit. And you really should be uh, shopping your portions by weight, okay? So buying the correct portions that you're looking for by weight. And what I mean by this is, too many people try and rely on their eyes, okay? They, they see a steak in the grocery store, or they see a chicken breast. But when you're cooking for one, you really need to stay within specific portions or you can dramatically overeat because if you're cooking by each, then you will cook one eight ounce chicken breast, right? You saw the, the cook along, the carefree cook along last Wednesday. I opened that pack of chicken breasts and it had an eight ounce chicken breast and a 4.5 ounce chicken breast. It was either a lopsided chicken or it came from two different chickens from production. They were not connected on the breastbone, so I know it wasn't a lopsided chicken. So if I just went ahead and cooked by the each, I'm cooking myself an eight ounce chicken breast. That, that's a lot to try and eat. So shop by weight. Shop by I'm buying five pounds of chicken total, and I'm gonna portion that into what I eat. Buy, um, 
uh, not by the each, but by the weight. The second thing is this por uh, portioning and storage. Now, I will have to do a video one day that watches me when I come home from the grocery store or the farmer's market because I've got an hour's worth of production breakdown uh, and storage when I come home with my things. When I buy a, a 12, uh, what a, a pound of bacon, right? I'm not buying slices of bacon. I'm buying weight of bacon. I immediately come home, open the pack, wrap them in sets of two in plastic wrap, put them in the freezer because I can't have that bacon sitting in there for two weeks or a week that it takes me to use up bacon. I'm only cooking for two people. So if you're only cooking for one person, when you get that bacon home, lay it out into one strip at a time, if you like, or your portion is two, or you like to eat three, I don't care what it is, and wrap them individually in plastic wrap and put them in the freezer. This way you can buy larger amounts by weight and break it down by storage. Um, the other thing is, I was mentioning chicken breast. If you come home uh, with the family pack of chicken breasts and they are eight ounces each, now is the time to use that horizontal cut that I showed you uh, last Wednesday and cut those chicken breasts into the size that you are actually going to cook, individually wrap them or wrap them by twos if you want or whatever your portion is and stack them up in the freezer. This is the time uh, to break down uh, dry ingredients. You don't have to worry about spoilage, uh, but this is the time maybe to buy a smaller amount of broccoli and one uh, they get sat in water like I've shown you before so they last a longer period. So again, what we're looking for is mindfulness, is breaking down these things into single use portions. Not having 10 chicken breasts sit in your refrigerator all week long until they go bad. Immediately break them down, put them in your fridge, and uh, get ready to use them as you're going to be cooking for one. And of course, the third step is using cooking methods. Now, certain cooking methods really don't lend themselves to cooking for one. Uh, are you going to make asabuco, for, you know, for one? Are you going to braise something over a long period of time? All right, maybe, maybe not, but really, if you want to be a little more efficient at cooking for one, use the quicker methods with less cleanup because this is the biggest objection I hear. Now, the, these are all semi-professional skills. Now, in a professional kitchen, we're requisitioning. We're not shopping. We're breaking down, storing, things like that. But these are things that you do in your kitchen as well. Um, but here's the idea with the, with the cooking methods that ultimately you have to like cooking to do any of this. And before I get to the fourth skill, which I said is really the professional one, um, let's make a premise here that, that you have to kind of like cooking. Because if you come up to me and say, Chef Todd, it's really hard to cook for one and I really hate cooking. Well, then we really got to look into why you hate cooking more than anything else. It doesn't matter how many people you cook for. So let's say, hey, I really hate cooking, but now I'm cooking for three and I suddenly love it. Like, if you don't like it, you don't like it, you, you know? So at some point, you have to learn how to like cooking and, and enjoy the process of cooking for one. And it makes so many of these things so much easier. So this is why I always point to methods because everybody, every carefree cook everywhere, every student in web cooking classes, anybody that's been a student of mine in culinary school or in my own school knows I start with the basic saute method. So if you learn the nine steps in the basic saute method that I just showed you uh, on Sunday, uh, on uh, Wednesday with that Mexi uh, chicken dish that we did, well, that's a lot more fun. You know, saute is the drive in the car of cooking. Heat up, heat down, liquids deglaze, thicken. Like to me, it's really, really cool. It's fun. If I were cooking for one, I would look forward to cooking just the... the, the the, the process of cooking and wouldn't use the fact that I'm cooking for one as an excuse to do it. So, okay, you, you got to like cooking, let's admit. But if you are good at a repeatable method, you will like cooking. That's the other thing. But here's the pro level secret and here's the way to do it that's going to make it a lot easier. And it's, whoops, it's what we call, wrong button, it's what we call a cycle menu. Now this, you know, I was never a fancy restaurant chef and you can probably tell that, <laughs> okay? Because I'm just, I'm not like a snotty, fancy, everything has to be, oh, 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 oh. I, I think if you uh, cook in your home and you enjoy your cooking, then you're as good as the fanciest chef. That's the way I feel. You, you know, there are plenty of chefs that cook better than I do. I don't know if there are too many that enjoy it <laughs> as much as I do. But 
That's why I was executive chef at a hospital. That's why I was a chef at assisted living uh, homes. That's why I was a chef in the university college environment because a cycle menu is one of the greatest things to ever be invented for a chef. It stinks being a restaurant chef because you never know how many people are going to show up. You'd be sitting there, two people could show up and you got all the food prepped. You've bought all this food all week long and nobody shows up to your restaurant. Or you don't think anybody's going to show up and you get you know, a tidal wave of people and you're in the weeds, you can't feed them. This is terrible. But an industrial chef like I was, a business dining chef, an education chef, relies on their cycle menu. They know how many people, just like you would know one, and they know exactly what they're going to be cooking in the future. But the best part of the cycle menu is that you can plan ahead and reuse the ingredients or reuse the prep. And that's what makes it so powerful for someone that's cooking for one. So let me give you some ideas on this, some basic cycle menu ideas. Here's an obvious one. What if uh, you had ground beef and instead of one hamburger, you make two hamburgers on Monday and then on Tuesday or Wednesday, that cooked hamburger meat is already done and it becomes your lasagna or it becomes your burrito or it becomes your chili. Y you know, it takes, the whole thing is the prep. Like imagine how long it takes to get out the ground beef, portion it into patties, put it on your scale, I hope, and weigh it uh, by weight. Uh, that takes the most time. So if you have to do it on Monday and then you got to go through the whole process again on Wednesday, yeah, it stinks cooking for one. But if you have a cycle menu idea that you know Monday is hamburger and Wednesday is going to be lasagna, you can do that. Grilled chicken. You have a grilled chicken breast on Tuesday, that turns into chicken salad. Make twice as much of it and then you've got a plan for chicken salad on lunch the next day. Um, I don't know, you steam shrimp that's going to go in a stir fry, that becomes um, shrimp and grits uh, on a following day. You are always thinking about two days ahead of production. And this is a way to think like an industrial production chef, which is kind of the way that I was. I was always thinking two or three days in advance. And at the end of any production uh, period, uh, serving lunch or dinner, all the food is counted and brought back. And the very first thing I'm thinking of is what can I do with that? What can I do with that? Where's that going to wind up the next day? Because I'm not throwing out food. We're not overproducing. This is the next problem for people that are cooking for one is that they overproduce and they feel really, really guilty about it. Uh, it roast off a turkey breast. Go ahead, buy yourself a two, one of those little two pound turkey breasts. Roast it off. Tur turkey with gravy one night. Turkey casserole tetrazzini the next day. Uh, your side dishes. You saute spinach on Monday. <laughs> you got a lot of food on Monday. <laughs> you saute spinach all right, I'll make it Thursday. You saute spinach on Thursday and you make extra and that's the stuffing for a piece of flounder or spinach stuffed chicken on Friday. You get the idea? All leftovers can be used in some way and cooking for one has a lot to do with creating leftovers so that they're going to go somewhere else in the future. Um, anything can become a stew. Anything can become a soup. Most things can become a chili. If you're having trouble cooking for one, think about these four elements that we were talking about right here. Shopping correctly, buying the correct portions by weight. You're going to cook by weight, not by each. Portioning and storaging, uh, storage correctly. Come home, put all these things away ahead of time so you're not wrestling with 12 slices of bacon all the time. Use the cooking methods that are quick that have one dish to them so you're not spending a lot of time doing dishes. Use the cooking methods that are fun, that you get involved in so you start to enjoy the process and start to think in a cycle menu mentality that every day that you cook, you have at least one or two things completed from the day before and it makes it so much easier. Uh, you know, when I was a chef at the National Security Agency, uh, like I said, 15,000 people twice a day at the end of a food production, we got a lot of food left over. We had two things and I'll let you in on a secret. The one, the first was garbage soup. The second was garbage pizza. Now we didn't have any signage that said this is garbage pizza, but in the back of the kitchen, that was our little joke. Like this is stuff that would have gone into the garbage. So if we have spaghetti and meatballs or something, don't you think those meatballs got ground up and wound up on top of a pizza the next day? I mean, that's just smart, right? That's smart to do. So 
garbage soup, garbage pizza, <laughs> start thinking in a garbage food sense. What you would have thrown out or what you would have overproduced has use for the next day, and that's how you, you really make uh, a, an opportunity to cook for one a lot easier, a lot more fun, and a lot more enjoyable. That's the, the really the key to cooking for one. Um, so what's going on in our Carefree Cooks community? You like that? Was that cool? Give me some hearts if you thought I've, I've finally cracked the cooking for one idea. I thought about that a lot. I was thinking about you guys a lot <laughs> this weekend. Uh, Carrie is saying, yes, yeah, uh, stews, and uh, soups, they freeze well also. That's a really good idea. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, Ron cooks a pound of bacon at once and then he uses it up during the week. Yeah, pre-production is one of the keys. When you're cooking for one, oh, it's raining hearts. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. When you're cooking for one, part of the part that stinks is the cooking, you know? Like, it, it, you have to do it again and again. You don't have to start all over all the time. Oh my goodness, I'm getting so many hearts. Thank you so much. Cooking for one, loved it. Yes, Philip says, always learning it. Eloisa says, always learning it. Carrie, again, yes, stews. K, I got like five hearts from K. Uh, Don, yeah, he the bacon man. Uh, Don uh, does sous vide um, and also vacuum packing thing. That's a great idea. Um, who else is telling me? Uh, yeah, Darlene's planning her menus ahead of time, shopping for the menus. This is the way to do it. Lynn is smoking meats ahead of time. Uh, hi, Antonelli. How you doing? Uh, Margaret's saying great ideas. This is good. Andrew plans his cooking ahead of time. This is smart. You know, I, I say that I really like to whip up foods, and you saw that on Sunday because I was just halfway through that Thai beef dish when I just turned on my phone. That's fun. Like, just inventing stuff on the fly is fun, but you got to have ingredients to just invent stuff with. If you're cooking for one, constantly staring, you know, with the refrigerator door open, staring into the refrigerator, you go into mind lock unless you go, oh my goodness, there's some meatballs. Uh, there's a little bit of cheese sauce that I made. There's unless you have stuff to work with, you know. So yeah, excellent point, Margaret. I appreciate that as well. I think Andrew was making that point. Marla uh, also. Brenda is with us. Uh, <laughs> Brenda's got to work on her strength. That's good. Hey, let's see what's going on in the Carefree Cooks community this week. Oh, it's fall. Fall has risen. And congratulations to Carol. Uh, Carol's 50th wedding anniversary this week. Congratulations, Carol. Congratulations, your husband. 50 years together. But you know what one of the most amazing things is? That um, Carol didn't go out to dinner. Wouldn't you think if it was your 50th wedding anniversary, it would be a special occasion and you would have to go out out for dinner. No! Carefree cooks know that the special occasion is staying in and sharing the experience of cooking together. Is there any better enjoyment of your love, of, of, of your relationship than creating and enjoying a meal together. It's really cool. Uh, the, the Carol did pan sauteed salmon with rice pilaf, sauteed spinach. Uh, she did shiitake mushroom chips that were really good. And then uh, they cracked open the champagne. So give a heart uh, to Carol and congratulate her on her 50th anniversary. That's really, really cool. Michael is still going baking crazy. But what I really love about this is Michael is, is, not only just making the same thing again and again, he's exploring different leavening agents, right? So this week he made pretzels. That's of course a yeast dough product. He made blueberry muffins, apple walnut muffins, orange cranberry muffins, which is a quick bread product leavened with baking soda or baking powder or both. Um, so they're dramatically different. The mixing methods are different. The panning methods are different. Uh, muffins don't have proofing, but pretzels do. This is the way you become a really well-rounded baker. Nicely done, Michael. Uh, t uh, Linda <laughs> has uh, a ton of tomatoes. Where she is, it's time to pull the tomatoes off the vine. So gallons and gallons of tomato sauce is going on. It's fall. I'm telling you, it's fall. And look at all these jars. We've got some instructions on uh, doing hot water canning and a high acid product like tomatoes or barbecue sauce or something like that appropriate for hot water canning. Uh, so she's got jars to last her the winter. That is really cool, Linda. I'm into that. Um, Jason's at it again. Him and his darn flat top and his camera. Man, oh man, he takes good pictures. But what I learned from Jason's dishes, if you give something a French name, it just sounds so much better. So this is his Buff Macaroni au Fromage. <laughs> uh, bacon wrapped sirloin, basically, with homemade mac and cheese and a, a, a deglazed red wine sauce. 
beautiful fall dish, huh? Really stick to your ribs kind of thing. Uh, making soups, it's fall time and it's fall time for soups. Michael's doing a roasted uh, squash soup. One of my favorites for fall and winter, roasted butternut squash. And this is so easy to do. In web cooking classes, we talk about the three types of soup and soups are categorized by their thickening agent. This is so easy to puree. I mean, this is the same as a carrot soup or lots of other things, but boy, it's delicious with a little bit of grilled cheese. Nothing more fall than that. I love it. Uh, Kathy, Kathy, this dish, here's another great thing about our Carefree Cooks community. Kathy's brave. I appreciate her. I admire her. Kathy uh, posted a picture of a dish that she didn't like. She said that it was a fail. Um, it was tomatoes. It's gnocchi with tomatoes, uh, zucchini, garlic, oregano, fromage blanc cheese, she said, some butter, shaved Parmesan, salt and pepper. She said it was really bland. Uh, you know, a little cheesy, but really bland. But you know what happened? She got like 50 comments from our Carefree Cooks community, all with suggestions. You might try this, you might do that, you might so on. For me, Kathy, one of the things that I love to do about gnocchi, because when they're poached in liquid first, usually you should use a flavorful liquid, like a chicken broth or something. Don't use water. <laughs> Nothing has less flavor than water. But after they're poached in a flavorful liquid, I like to let them dry a little bit, steam off on a sheet pan, and then saute them in butter and put a little crispiness on them, right? A little caramelization, a little sweetness on them. So a moist convective cooking method in poaching, but then go to your dry conductive in a saute pan with some butter and you'll, you'll find you get a little more flavor out of the gnocchi. Otherwise they're, they're kind of doughy, you know? Um, Sam is a plate artist and he's at it again. Um, this was, I forget what he said, like, oh, I didn't know what to do, so I just whipped this up. These are the things that Carefree Cooks just whip up, right? Th this is somebody else's unbelievable elevation, but to Carefree Cooks, eh, we don't care. We just whipped it up, you know? So Sam put together a panko crusted, roasted, bone in chicken leg. What a great idea. Like, I wouldn't think of a, a bone in item being crusted in panko, that was a great idea. Um, he did a Dijon mustard thyme sauce, roasted heirloom carrots. Look at those, you don't have to always chop things into little pieces, right? Those beautiful, just long multicolor carrots, really, really cool. Uh, delicata squash stuffed with sweet potato whipped with lime vest. That's what z lime zest. That's what this little squash thing is. I can't get, get on the other side of that image. That's what the squash thing is. Amazing, huh? I mean, not overly complicated. You know a three-step breading procedure. You do that with the panko. The carrots are simple roasting. The squash is just beautiful, like hollowing something out and stuffing it with something else. Really, really cool. Nicely done, Sam. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and of course, not everything in the Carefree Cooks is necessarily about food. Uh, we do talk about knives a lot. We talk about pots and pans. We do talk about the equipment, but I never want it to become a flea market because you don't need to buy anything to become a Carefree free cook. It, you do not have to have expensive pans, but uh, Bob reminded us, reminding us that your sharpening stone does not bounce. <laughs> you know, oh, poor Bob. When you drop that on the floor, yeah, it's pretty much going to shatter. That's what's been going on in the Carefree Cooks community. Um, and again, a, a happy anniversary to Carol. Uh, so this week, uh, we are going to get together and do uh, another Carefree Cook Along. I want to try and do this again uh, come Wednesday, all right? So on the Carefree Cook Along, I think what we're going to do is a shrimp etouffee, like a Cajun shrimp dish, because this enables me to demonstrate uh, kind of the paella method. Etouffee and paella, very similar. And by the time Wednesday evening comes along at 6 p.m., um, I might wind up making paella anyway. I'm a carefree cook. I can do whatever I want, right? But for now, we're set up for a uh, Cajun shrimp etouffee. We're going to plan ahead. If I were cooking for one, I might have already poached the shrimp. I might have already done those things. But here's the stuff that you need. If you want to cook along with us, 6 p.m. Baltimore time, East Coast time, if you want to cook along, you need some peeled and deveined shrimp, all right? I will do a quick demonstration on cleaning shrimp, but we don't want to sit there and, and for like 10 minutes and watch me clean an entire pound of shrimp. So you need P&D shrimp of any size that you want. 
Uh, I can't tell you how many because that would then sound like a recipe. I can probably tell you the weight and it's usually about four ounces per person, four to five ounces per person. So you figure that out. We're gonna need some butter. We're gonna need some red pepper that I'll cut. I'll show you knife skills. We need onion and garlic, diced tomatoes. You can either do the tomato concasse like we show in web cooking classes week uh, 10, I think it is, or get a can of diced tomatoes. That's what I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna use a can. We're gonna need some all-purpose flour, some chicken broth. Um, we can't sit and watch rice cook for 45 minutes either, so go ahead and make yourself some rice. It doesn't matter, white rice, brown rice, whatever you want. We need some Worcestershire sauce and your seasoning, thyme, oregano, paprika, cayenne pepper, some white pepper, some salt. And if you wanna be alerted, because everybody was saying, I didn't know you'd be cooking, don't forget to go to uh, webcookingclasses.com slash live and get your alert that I'll be going live at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, East Coast U.S., Baltimore, USA, and we'll be cooking uh, the uh, Cajun shrimp etouffee cook along this week. Uh, if you love what we've talked about today, if you know someone that's cooking for one and needs a plan, share this video with them. This could be very helpful. If you like what you saw, share it with friends. Uh, give me some hearts, give me some love, because that way other people, it will draw attention to it as well, because we are carefree cooks. We're inclusive, we're empowering, we're enlightening, we're encouraging, we want everybody to cook this way. That's my goal. That's my mission. Everybody should start on this journey. And if you need to start on your own carefree cooking journey, the best way is to get a roadmap, is to get a guidebook, and my five forks to carefree cooking will help you make those decisions at either fork in the road to become a carefree cook in your own right. So thank you so much for being with me today, everyone. This is great. Uh, I'll look through the comments on there and make sure I get in and answer anything that needs to be answered. Thank you for the cavalcade of hearts and love. Uh, this has been a great time. Chef Todd Moore will get together 6 p.m. on Wednesday evening, and we'll see you again next Tuesday Talk Live because I'm reminding you uh, that there's a method to your cooking success. Bye-bye, everyone.